The first song that we just sang is a healing song. It's by, uh, caught by Uncle Klapmach, uh, song catcher Shirley James. It's a song for, for all of us on this plane who are alive and for the journey of healing that we must still do. And the next song we're going to sing is um, a traveling song, and it's a crossing over song. And it was caught by Pura Fey, who's a Tuscarora song catcher. It's in my family's language, Nehiaoi, in the Cree language. And tonight we sing that song for all of the missing and murdered indigenous women, girls, and two-spirited beings. Hi, hi.
Well, thank you first to the Hidden River, River singers uh, who came from, come from four different First Nations and who are all artists in, in many different areas. And uh, I, I want to say it's a great privilege for all of us, I want to say this on behalf of all of you, for them giving us a healing song and a traveling song. These are, this is rare, this is very valuable, this has enormous meaning uh, to all of us. Um, also, I want to thank uh, Chief Stacy Laforme of the Mississauga of the Credit, who opened Six Degrees this morning at the AGO, where we hold the daytime uh, events, these two very, very full days with 3,000 people taking part, all told. Um, he does a great honor by his presence, uh, and he was speaking earlier this evening at another event uh, with, for us. We're on his people's traditional territory, but also the traditional territory of the Haudenosaunee, the Anishinaabek, the Huron-Wendat, and most recently, uh, Chief Laforme's people, the Mississaugas, Mississaugas of the Credit First Nation. But, and I think this is, you know, we don't really, ex these are protocols, they're very, very important. Everything important and real begins with a protocol. And we don't explain them enough. And the second part of the protocol has to do with the fact that we are all living within the dish with one spoon treaty. Um, and this treaty territory is a, is, is a treaty which invites all people, indigenous nations and all newcomers, uh, to live here in the spirit of peace, friendship, and respect. And I want to add to that one very important further fact that this idea of the dish with one spoon, which ought to be used all the time by all of us as part of our uh, language, this phrase has enormous meaning because what it means is it's an egalitarian phrase. It means that we, sh we should all be sitting around the same bowl, eating from it with the same spoon. It's a symbol as we would say at the ICC and Six Degrees of Inclusion. It's very modern, as is the case with so much of indigenous philosophy. Uh, it has leapt from the past into the future of this country, and it tells us what kind of country uh, we should be. And I'd also like to recognize two of the four or five founders of the La Fontaine uh, Baldwin lecture series. It's the 17th year of it. First, Laura Baldwin, who's sitting right there, and who's... There are many Baldwins in the room, but Laura was, is, was very active and all the way through, and she's here every year. And I'd also like to recognize one of the other founders, my old friend Michael Levine, who's sitting just down there. So yesterday we began with one of our many extended citizenship ceremonies that we do for the government. It's our original ICC grassroots program. There's the ceremony with lots of music added and all sorts of interesting talks and things. But before the ceremony, we hold a one hour fascinating round table discussion between engaged citizens and new citizens. And during that discussion, the new citizens, the people who are about to be sworn in, uh, discuss what they're going to do, not as immigrants, as citizens, what they're going to do to improve the country, to change the country, to contribute to the future. And every time we do one of these ceremonies, we're astonished by the ideas, the new ideas, the new thoughts, the criticisms, the imagination that comes out. But a second thing happens at these ceremonies. We offer, and it happens at all 3,000 of the citizenship ceremonies hold, er, held everywhere in Canada. Indeed, the 75 we do, we hold them in all provinces and territories every year. We also offer to all new citizens membership in a program created years ago called, was originally called the Cultural Access Pass, and we now call it CANOE. Uh, you don't have to do the English and the French, it's one word in both languages. It's spelled C-A-N-O-O. -O. Uh, and this program offers every new citizen free membership, and their families, free membership in 1500 art galleries, public art galleries, museums, provincial parks, federal parks, uh, every form of cultural institution in the country and increasingly in the performing arts. And why 
Because, first of all, everybody from the moment they immigrate here is paying for our culture through their taxes. It's theirs. But secondly, because culture lies at the absolute heart of any civilization. And the sooner that new citizens get actively involved in taking the culture to the next stage, the better. After all, there's no such thing as a culture which is fixed in time. If it's fixed, it's dead. All real cultures are growing, expanding, changing all the time. And every wave of immigrants becoming new citizens is adding something new and surprising to what the culture of this country uh, is. So this is the evening of the LaFontaine Baldwin lecture. It also comes at the end of the first day of the fourth annual Six Degrees. We've spent all day, if we're all looking, the people from Six Degrees looking a bit ragged, we've spent from morning till night until now uh, discussing, debating with hundreds of people uh, at the AGO. And so our, um, our fourth, our 17th LaFontaine Baldwin lecture, Adam Gopnik, who's sitting right there, uh, plays a key role in the middle of these two full days. He's sort of the hinge in the middle of this debate. And it's, it's, a, it's a very interesting role to play. There are 65 speakers taking part in the whole event, six degrees from 20 countries. Um, they're all pretty well all with us in the theater tonight. You'll meet a couple of them later on as we bring them into conversation with Adam Gopnik. Um, unfortunately, there were going to be four, but two of them um, have, uh, are a bit sick, so they're not going to be here. We're trying to get another one of them to intervene. Um, uh, but uh, f for all of you, as you're listening to these speakers, I want you to also think, if you haven't been coming to the AGO, there's a whole day tomorrow. It's full, but there are lots of stairs to sit on. And uh, we'd love to have you there. Uh, and if you want to come, talk to somebody wearing a Six Degrees uh, sweatshirt, and they'll help organize it for you. So, every year, 17 times, we've had to work out who will be the right person for, the right, for this time, that time, to continue the struggle for citizen-based democracy, which Louis-Philippe Lafontaine and Robert Baldwin were central to introducing in Canada 171 years ago. That's really the job of the Lafontaine Baldwin Lecture, the continuation of this astonishingly unexpected, and I hesitate to use the word revolutionary because I know Adam will give me a hard time over that, but it was in a sense revolutionary change in direction of this colony. The lecture series every year is filled with intentionality. It's always about advancing the public good, inclusion, and egalitarianism, because that was the lesson we received when we started putting in place the first successful democratic movement in the country. And whenever we go off track, betrayal of the treaties, appalling mistreatment of First Nations people, anti-Semitism, the, the Chinese head tax, all of these things, we are betraying the message what, which lay at the heart of what LaFontaine and Baldwin and that great reform movement introduced into the country. It's a great measuring poll for whether we're doing well or not. And Adam Gopnik's whole career has been, I believe, I think we all believe, about finding different ways to advance these sorts of ideas. Most often by drawing together the experiences of different countries. It's hard to think of many people who could be called true humanists and who have worked so hard at finding ways to strengthen the fundamental concepts of inclusion, restraint, and debate, and respect for the other. Because of this commitment that Adam has made through his writing and his speaking, people around the world look to him for passageways towards a better future. And I always feel that he has, you know, writers look at writers and think, what is he doing? What is she doing? How are they doing that? How are they getting to us? And he, I think Adam has an uncanny knack for bringing together the perfectly intellectual with the highly personal, and he makes it look easy. Of course, it's the hardest thing you can possibly do. The easy thing is to write something that nobody understands. 
And in this way of bringing together the perfectly intellectual and the highly personal, he is right at the core of the tradition of the greatest humanist writers throughout history. Adam is the perfect La Fontaine Baldwin lecture at this particular time of profound confusion and hysteria. He brings us to where we need to be if we're going to continue to build a humanist society. And as I said, this is very much in line, and he is very much in line with everything that La Fontaine and Baldwin and their allies stood for. In 1848, a little historical moment that I have to give you every year, and I change the bits. In 1848, La Fontaine and Baldwin uh, found a way to maneuver London, the empire, into ceding virtual independence through something called, something very boring sounding, called responsible government. An obscure term designed to avoid the powers in Britain from understanding what we were really doing to them. Hypocrisy and cleverness and deviousness is essential for a weaker country dealing with an empire. What was happening was that power was being peacefully transferred from an empire to the citizens of a colony. Democracy was being installed against the wishes of the entire governing and opposition elites in Britain, including the entire left in Britain. They were all against any form of democracy or independence in the colonies, including in Canada. And I always say that this was the first time in the history of empires that a colony actually managed to talk its way out of an empire. And if you've ever wondered why Canadians like endless debates and endless speech giving and endless shouting at each other, that's how we've managed to move forward while avoiding civil war. It wasn't just that responsible government would transfer power to the citizenry and their parliament, it was the astonishing social program that came with it. It wasn't an ethnic or a religious uh, or even a linguistic movement. It was a social movement. And you saw some of the highlights in the video. There, on top of that, their ethical principles drove that program. And they talked a lot about what their ethical principles were. An egalitarian society open to complexity, what today we would call diversity. So it started in 1840 when La Fontaine wrote the manifesto of the great reform movement, which would lead to the great ministry and it was called the Address to the Electors of Terrebonne. The first law they passed when they took power in March 1848 and in April, they passed an immigration bill. They created an immigration bill, which is the beginning of what we have formally and through law today. We've had terrible downs and some pretty good ups, and we're maybe getting better at avoiding the horrible downs and betrayals and so on, but it all begins legally with that law in April 1848. And then in the middle of the address to the electors of Terrebonne, uh, La Fontaine launched into a dramatic explanation as to why social equality was central to democracy. He said, pour nous empêcher d'en jouir, il faudrait détruire l'égalité sociale qui forme le caractère distinctif tant de la population du Haut Canada que de celle du Bas Canada. Les mœurs sont plus fortes que les lois et rien ne saurait nous soustraire à leur puissance. Il ne peut exister en Canada aucune caste privilégiée en dehors et au-dessus de la masse de ses habitants. Just in case, they can deny us our political liberty only if they are able, this is the colonial powers, the family compact and so on, they can deny us our political liberty only if they are able to destroy that social equality which constitutes the distinctive characteristic as much of the population of Upper Canada as of Lower Canada. The principles of the people are stronger than the laws imposed upon them. No privileged caste beyond and above the mass of the people can exist in Canada. So, first of all, this is a work in progress. Um, secondly, uh, they were clear in their own minds. This, this would only work outside of race, outside of religion, that we could have multiplicities of everything, diversity, complexity, but it all had to be driven by ethics, 
by ideas of humanism, of inclusion. It was these principles, you know, this is not somebody sort of marginal. This is the first prime minister of Canada as a democracy who wrote that. They came to power on that policy. And those things that you saw in short form in the video, that's what they did as a result of what they believed in. And it was these principles that brought them not only to power, uh, it was why they immediately brought in a proper immigration law, one of the first in the world, maybe the first. That's why they set about removing immediately the class-based structures inherited from England and France. That's why they massively reformed the legal system, the education system, the administrative system, in order to move power to the citizens. And we're still working our way slowly forward on the route they laid out in the 1840s. So, you can see from all of this that Adam Gopnik, with his commitments to institutionalized humanism, is the perfect choice for the 17th LaFontaine Baldwin lecture. Adam Gopnik. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all for coming. Thank you, John for that beautiful introduction. Um, John, of course, said everything I was intending to say <laughs> tonight. Um, not the first time that's happened to me in this hall. Um, some of you may have been here when I delivered the final Massey lecture in 2011, and it was building up to the climax of a beautiful Joni Mitchell song. And my introducer on that occasion uh, read the entire lyric of the song before I stepped out on stage, thereby reducing it to one of the most massive anticlimaxes <laughs> ever endured here. But I love Joni Mitchell. You know, I, we all love the music we heard in high school. But if you went to high school in 1970 and 1971 in Canada, you actually heard the best music that was ever made. <laughs> yes, exactly. And my sense of a connection between music and Canada is a very powerful and passionate one uh, for me. I always love coming home to Canada, even to Upper Canada, rather than my native Lower Canada. And uh, the past few days, getting ready to speak to you tonight, um, I discovered that there's a wonderful uh, open piano right outside that beautiful music store on Bloor Street. And whenever I feel uncertain about uh, the direction I want to take tonight, I go down there and wait on the street till the piano is clear and play Michelle Legrand tunes to clear my head. And I notice that a line forms of amateur pianists who just want to kind of clear the music out of their fingers before continuing on down Bloor Street. That struck me in the tradition of Baldwin and LaFontaine is a highly Canadian social practice. I could only imagine what would happen in my adopted city of New York if you left a piano out on the street <laughs> permanently. Once upon a time, when I first moved to uh, New York, it, yes, indeed, it would have been stolen. Now, somebody would have turned it into a condo, um, <laughs> bought the air rights over it, and mounted one of those horrible, thin, 90-story uh, towers that I call the oligarch's erections in my own, <laughs> in my adopted city of New York. But though that seems a small thing, it seems to me a place to begin talking about exactly the, the heritage of Baldwin and LaFontaine, because it's a small thing we take so much for granted. And that is the existence of social peace, the practice of political coexistence, the idea that we can take turns on the piano and that our primacy at the piano is not determined by our genes or clan, our birth or our background, but by our readiness to play. I remember when I first really understood the example of Baldwin and LaFontaine in reading John's beautiful little book about the two men in a way that, like many of you tonight, I'm sure, had never fully been revealed to me by my countless classes in Canadian history in grade school and in high school. And I became aware that exactly the beauty, the potency, the importance of the example of Baldwin and LaFontaine was that it was a truly revolutionary gesture without a revolutionary rhetoric or a violent practice attached to it. Baldwin and LaFontaine stood together against an anti-Catholic crowd 
in Montreal and simply by their act of beautifully passive, impassive resistance made it plain that coexistence was possible and that bigotry would be rejected in the country they wanted to found and dreamed of leading. That's an incredibly potent and incredibly powerful social example, rare in the world. Rare in the world and vanishing, we fear. You know, someone once said that each one of us, each man and woman, has the philosophy of his or her insomnia. I think it may have been me. I've been trying to track it to earth. But certainly I have the philosophy of my insomnia. And by that I mean that the things we think about, we talk about, at three in the afternoon are different from the things that cause us existential anxiety at 3 a.m. in the morning. At 3 p.m. we talk about politics and the uh, election and we talk in a narrow and contestatory way. We may talk about sports. We may wonder if the Leafs could win a Stanley Cup this year for the first time since 1967, as us Montrealers rem recall and remind you. We ask all of those simple kinds of practical, sometimes ethical questions, but at 3 a.m., we ask the profound questions. We ask the enormous questions, the existential questions. And the philosophy of my insomnia turns on the crisis and the potential collapse of liberal civilization, on the potential destruction of exactly those social practices those habits and rules of nonviolent coexistence, that effort at pluralism that La Fontaine and Baldwin instantiate for us in Canada. If you suffer from the philosophy of your insomnia, one of the things you can do is turn it into the insomnia of your philosophy. And you do that by waking your partner at 3 a.m. <laughs> and insisting that he or she listen to your complaints. I will plead guilty to doing that. It's a flaw made even worse if you are an author who has recently published a book because to the philosophy of your insomnia is added that thriving, if invisible literary genre, the reply to your critics. Your spouse is compelled to listen to both. And when I spoke to my own wonderful Winnipeg Icelandic spouse earlier today and said, really, what should I tell them? And she said, make them stay up with you. <laughs> and that's exactly what I'm going to try and do for the next few minutes. I'm going to compel you to stay up with me at 3 a.m. to share those anxieties, to share that sense of the potential loss of something inestimably precious. We live at a moment, at a time, when the core values and practices of liberal democracy, what John rightly calls liberal humanism, are under assault in a way that they have not been at least since the 1930s. We see it throughout Europe, in Britain, in Hungary, in Turkey. We see it most immediately and most painfully in the United States of America, where every day a new insult to the basic practices of tolerance and pluralism is offered, where every day some hideous affront to the very idea of the rule of law is offered, and we see ourselves too passive, too helpless in the face of these affronts. So much so that it's sometimes said that the tradition of La Fontaine and Baldwin, the tradition of liberal democracy, is simply vanishing from the world as an historical vestige, a remnant that no longer has any real relevance. Though it's a frightening thought, terrifying thought, and one that keeps me awake at 3 a.m. The idea, not that any particular political party might be in or out of power, but that the basic ideas of the oscillation of government, of the possibility of arriving at self-government through reason, is over. I began to write a book trying to address exactly this idea not very long ago, and when I tried to sum up what seemed to me the core practices, the core 
principles of liberal democracy and of liberal humanism, I didn't want to turn to abstract principles. I wanted to turn to the lived examples of real people. And my thoughts immediately turned to my very favorite, my most heroic couple amongst the great liberal Democrats and liberal humanists. And that was, of course, the greatest of all liberal philosophers, John Stuart Mill, and his lover and wife, and as he always assured the world, his greatest teacher and partner, Harriet Taylor. Now, some of you may know the story of Mill and Taylor, how they met at a dinner party in London in the 1830s and immediately fell wildly in love with each other, even though she was married and had three children to whom she was devoted, and how they began a clandestine romance, so much so that they would slip each other notes uh, inviting the other to meet them. And their favorite place to meet was in front of the rhinoceros cage in the London Zoo. Now, if you think about it, you realize that that was marked by the kind of acuity that is only provided to philosophers. Because they knew at once that everyone would be looking at the rhinoceros and no one would be looking at the couple on the bench outside the rhinoceros cage. Passionately in love, they nonetheless turned their minds to the betterment of their fellow man. Oh, they were in love, and we don't know for certain if they had actually shared love to that point. They had gone off for a week to Paris, and it's my own peculiar and idiosyncratic hypothesis that no two people go off for a week in Paris with no consequences. But while they sat on the bench looking at the rhinoceros, they shared the ideas that would be central to the moral adventure of liberal democracy. On the one hand, Mill was working on his great book on liberty, the foundational document of our belief that the end of liberty is not known to us, that liberty is an absolute rather than a merely instrumental term, that there is no idea that doesn't benefit from being scrutinized, no leader who can't be criticized, no theology that doesn't evolve from inspection. That idea of the right and the necessity of individual autonomy was central to him, but at the same time, Harriet Taylor was inventing and putting forward the ideas that would lead to their other great and foundational book on the subjection of women. An equally powerful testament, but this one of the necessity of absolute social equality between the sexes, not the small, small or slow promotion of women into certain areas of public life, but the absolute equality of men and women in every sphere, artistic, economic, and political. And the key conception born at that moment was that those two impulses, the impulse towards individual liberty and the impulse towards inclusion, the impulse, impulse towards social equality, were not contradictory. No, they were complementary. One fed the other. One was necessary for the other. We couldn't have a fully human idea of liberty if any part of the human family remained enslaved or disenfranchised. And by enfranchising and emancipating the totality of humanity, we gave each one of us ever greater orbit for the possibility of exercising our liberty, by which Mill didn't just mean the narrow liberty of self-seeking, no, not at all, by which he meant the full possibility of each human being discovering and exploring their potential to be poets or musicians, philosophers, or saints, if they so chose. And on that beautiful foundation wrought in front of the rhinoceros cage, that idea we celebrate tonight, the idea that individualism and inclusiveness are not negatives, but are complementary positives, was born. I love the idea of the rhinoceros as well, because the rhinoceros seemed to me the perfect heraldic emblem of the liberal democratic idea. What is a rhinoceros, after all? Well, a rhinoceros is simply a traveler's tale, a recounting of a unicorn. 
Travelers went to Africa and they saw ugly rhinoceroses with a squat horn in the middle of their forehead, and they came back, and as we all do when we come home and talk to the people we've left behind, we say, oh, I saw this amazing animal. It was silver and white with a long mane and a long curlicued corn in the middle of its forehead. And so the unicorn took the place of the rhinoceros in the imagination and on the tapestries and poetry of Western man. The only problem with the unicorn is that it doesn't exist. The rhinoceros is squat and ugly. A more sinfully unappealing animal has never been created by God or Darwin. And yet, it's the formidable creature. It's the creature that exists and persists and is powerful. And in that way, it's a heraldic emblem of the liberalism that we try to perpetuate in this conference and celebrate here tonight, exactly because, as John said, it isn't sexy, it isn't necessarily glamorous. The forms and the terms, the treaties and the papers by which it's introduced to us may often seem tedious or dull or merely procedural. And yet, more than any other movement, it has produced societies of relative peace and unexampled pluralism. That vision, that dream of inclusion and individualism, hand in hand going together, has, as I say, never been under the kind of assault it is tonight, at least in the past 75 years. And some people say that vision is simply finished. It's extinguished. It no longer has historical currency. I think we should be grateful to some people who have reminded us very recently that that isn't so. Anyone who believes in the values of liberal democracy should first of all be hugely grateful to Vladimir Putin. <laughs> Because Putin, only a few months ago, announced unequivocally that his enemy, his ideological enemy, his chief political foe, was liberalism. Liberalism, he said, is defunct. Now, the liberalism he was saying was defunct was not the neoliberalism of uh, reborn or reinvented free market societies. No, that's something he has enormous affection for, particularly in the kleptocratic form <laughs> in which it's pursued in his autocratic Russia. No, it wasn't capitalism he was complaining about, nor was it, for that matter, socialism, for whose past life in its authoritarian form he has great nostalgic respect. No, the liberalism that Putin was decrying and claiming was defunct was exactly the liberalism of sympathy and compassion that had led Angela Merkel and the German government to open its doors to refugees from Syria, to the wretched of the earth, in an old-fashioned term, who needed a place to come to. It was that core liberal value of compassion, of ever-expanding circles of empathy, that Putin had contempt for. And he had contempt for it because it ran exactly counter to the vision of power and ethnic nationalism, which he describes and which he inhabits. Western liberalism is defunct, Putin said, pointing to the practice of political compassion. Donald Trump, I might add, immediately agreed with him and said that Western liberalism was indeed dead. You only had to go to San Francisco and Los Angeles to see that this was so. A different conception of what was meant by Western liberalism. That's a true story. <laughs> But equally contemptuous of the enterprise and its roots in ever-expanding circles of compassion. And not long after, the students in Hong Kong began to protest on a massive scale against the removal of those practices of openness, of liberal democracy, that had, to be sure, been bequeathed to them by a colonial government, but which, in the classic way of political history, had come to be adapted by them as a kind of emergent system. An emergent system in the Darwinian sense, meaning something that comes to us from one origin, but which we find multiple uses for, and that we can make our own. And that was exactly what the Hong Kong students were saying about the liberal system that they had inherited. They weren't striking, they are not striking tonight. On behalf of 
economic opportunity, which one might find in China, they were striking to prevent the arbitrary enforcement of law, to reinforce exactly the rule of law, which means simply that though the cops and judges are paid by the government, they are not told what to do by the government. They answer to some larger system of justice than mere tyranny and power. Those two examples should at least make us clear about what side we want to take, what's at stake at this extraordinary and dangerous historic moment. It might make us want, for one thing, to enumerate those institutions, those practices, those principles of liberal democracy. Some of the major ones, some of the macro ones, if you like, some of the obvious ones are ones that we all know and that we can all name. I'm going to take a quick water break here. You can, if I were a good sixth grade teacher, I would say, now who can name them? <laughs> Some of them we all can name. Free and fair elections of the kind we are entertaining right now here in Canada. Elections that can involve everyone from the far left to, like it or not, the far right in which everyone has a chance to articulate a view, in which those views can be debated in the public sphere, in the public square, and in which results can be found which, however often inequitable or unsatisfying, nonetheless correspond in some way to the consensus of the country. Free elections, fair procedures, the rule of law, meaning an idea of justice that is not simply responsive to the whims of a tyrant. All of those things are part of the macro organization of liberal democracy. Things like open universities, universities where people can speak and write, dissenting ideas without fear of being censored or squelched. We know those institutions. We probably underestimate them somewhat because of our familiarity with them. We grew up with those institutions. We think that they're hardy because they're so familiar to us. And as a consequence, many of us on right and left alike rarely stop to think about how vanishingly rare those institutions and practices are in the history of the world. How utterly unusual it is for us to believe that we can go to the ballot box and cast our vote for whom we choose. That if we are arrested, we will not be accused of a political crime. Someone will have to show us guilty of an actual crime. That if we teach at a university, we are not responsive to a central committee or to an autocrat, but rather responsive only to our own ideas of intellectual integrity. Those are extraordinary practices, and they are vanishingly rare in the world's history, and they are incredibly fragile. The reason we live in a moment of emergency is exactly because we are witnessing how incredibly fragile those practices and institutions are, how quickly they can be extinguished by the wave of ethnic nationalism that rolls around the world, by contempt for fair procedure, by simple, unexpected disdain for the very workings of a democratic system. Like that, in the space of two years, norms and premises that we thought were sterling and strong have already been vaporized in the United States. But those large, obvious institutional practices rest on smaller, more immediate, more local, and more human practices as well. That's why the idea of liberal humanism, which John cited in his introduction, is always compound. Humanism is what liberalism, in our broad institutional sense has to rest on. Wherever you look, whenever you try to understand how it is the democratic institutions can function and even flourish, you realize that they lie on a strong foundation of what sociologists like to call social capital, meaning the conditions and the little communities of trust within which we all have to live if we're to 
engage in the larger adventure of liberal democracy. We have to have experience in dealing equitably, if with annoyance, with people who are not of our clan, not of our nation, not of our kind, in order to engage in the larger and more abstract pursuit of free and fair liberal democratic institutions. Now, what do I mean by that? It's social capital can seem like a terribly uh, remote or abstract idea, small communities of sympathy and trust, even though we all inhabit them all the time. Well, one of the classic examples is one that here at Six Degrees we've been celebrating today, and that is the power of the coffee house. One of the great rediscoveries of the literature of the French Enlightenment of the 18th century in the past 50 years was how crucial, how vital the role of the coffee house was. The Enlightenment was made, we know now, not in courts, but among the saucers, in the coffee houses where people could come together, argue, converse, share ideas. And it wasn't simply, or most important, the specific ideas, the specific debates that they shared, no. What was important is that they had the habit of debating. They learned the social practice of sharing ideas. They were familiar with the notion that you could sit down with a stranger and rise illuminated, enlightened. And that social practice in itself became the seedbed for the ideas of equality and solidarity that would bloom later. Coffee houses sound terribly remote, but they're terribly vital. I wrote a long essay not long ago in The New Yorker about the role of coffee houses in the emancipation of the Jews of Central Europe, how each one of the great European cities had a coffee house that was frequented by Jews who were just emerging into their own wholeness and fullness as people, and where they could literally go and try on outfits, try on a new kind of clothes, to see what new kind of people they chose to become. The coffee house was the, the pivot point, the cockpit in which this great act of self-emancipation and self-education could take place. And don't think, don't think that the coffee house belongs to the past. If any of you have studied the urban history of Iran and of the great city of Tehran, particularly in the last few years, you'll know that there is an ongoing war between the young men and women who coalesce and come together at coffee houses where they can speak as they choose, dress as they choose, and the theocratic religious police who consistently try to shut down those coffee houses. They've shut down 500 in this year alone, exactly because they recognize the toxic threat that free conversation poses to the autocratic imagination. Those are the kinds of smaller communities of trust, of conversation, that are essential if the larger institutions of liberal democracy are to survive and flourish. We call it social capital sometimes, but my own favorite name for this enterprise comes from that great park designer of New York, Frederick Law Olmsted, who also designed the great park on Mount Royal, where I did all of my skating and skiing and courting as a teenager. Olmsted was a journalist before he ever designed a square foot of parkland. And he went to the South in the pre-Civil War period of the United States, and he tried to contemplate not just the horrors of the concentration camp society that he saw all around him, but also to understand what it seemed to him its enormous cultural impoverishment. And when he returned to New York, he said, what the South lacks because of the hideous moral straightening of slavery is what Olmsted called by the beautiful name of commonplace civilization. And what did he mean by commonplace civilization? He meant all the things we do that have no overt political role, which exactly, as I said before, accustom us to the necessary work of building community. And he enumerated them. I'm, can I remember his enumeration? I don't think I can, so I'm going to read it to you will be the one thing I read you tonight. He said, in the North, 
everyone is sure to become interested in social enterprises. School, road, cemetery, asylum and church corporations, bridge, ferry, and water companies, literary, scientific, art, mechanical, agricultural, and benevolent society, societies. Our young men and women are members and managers of reading rooms, public libraries, gymnasiums, game clubs, boot clubs, ball clubs, all sorts of clubs, Bible classes, debating societies, military companies. They are planting roadside trees, or damming streams for skating ponds, or rigging diving boards, or getting up fireworks displays, or private theatricals. They are always doing something. And in that way, Olmsted had the vision, the inspiration, to build a great park in the center of Manhattan exactly in order to allow that kind of commonplace civilization to flourish, generation after generation, new arrival of immigrant after new arrival of immigrant. Because he understood that it was in that variety of engagements, that building of social trust among unlike kinds, that real democracy had to reside. Now that's an idea that's been reinforced and restated again and again in every part of the recent literature of the social sciences. I call tonight's lecture Mind Over Matter with exactly that phenomenon in mind. We don't get economic development as a consequence of conditions of social trust. No, just the opposite is true. Economic development happens as a consequence of our building social trust, as a consequence of our investing in education, as a consequence of our learning to live in a plural world. We get it just backwards if we think of those things as the decorative, ornamental embroidery on the fabric of liberal democracy. No, they are really the foundation of it, that capacity to live, to relate in a coffee house, or any kind of shared community, one to the other. There's something else that's terribly important to see about that relationship between the undergrowth and the overgrowth. And that is that while the fruits of liberal democracy may be incredibly rare and extremely fragile, the roots of the open society are incredibly robust and planetary. The great economist Samyarta Sen has written wonderfully about how those basic underlying preconditions can be found in every society as preconditions for the possibility of economic growth and social stability. They don't belong to any one tradition, though we celebrate the Western tradition to which so many of us, in which so many of us have been educated, far broader vestiges of the Confucian past of the Buddhist past have also contributed equally to creating the conditions of inquiry and openness, of doubt, social openness, that enable liberal democratic institutions to flourish. The roots of those institutions, exactly because they lie in common human practices of sharing and coexistence, turn out to be extraordinarily powerful, even as we become aware that the fruits of that tree can be incredibly short-lived, fragrant, but in need of constant protection. Someone said not long ago in an article in The Economist talking about the new wave of Russian dissidents, someone quoted one of the Russian dissidents saying that all she wanted was for Russia to become a normal country. Now, that put a bit of a smile on my face because I thought, well, Russia has never been a normal country in that way. Russia has so rarely in its history been able to enjoy the possibility of openness, of liberal humanism instantiated in its institutions. Brief period at the beginning of the 20th century, another brief period now between these great vast seas of autocracy and tyranny. And yet, in another way, I understood perfectly what that young dissident was saying. Normalcy is not simply the familiarity of some political system. It's a test, a measure of our expectations of life. We all know in our intimate circles, in our broader social circles, in our neighborhoods, and in our cities, what's involved 
in living in conditions of trust and sympathy, however uneasy, however partial, however easily attenuated those conditions may be, we know those things. They're a fundamental part of the human condition. And so when we say that we want to live in a normal country, we may not be appealing to a history that may yet remain unkind and ungenerous to us, but we are certainly appealing to our own knowledge of the possibilities, the potency of human sympathy when it's applied in any circle, large or small. That understanding that liberal democratic institutions rest on the common practice of coexistence seems to me central to our path, to our task in moving forward to defend those institutions. Because it reminds us of a fundamental truth. We can't defend those institutions simply as instantiated, macro, large political realities. We have first to defend them in their immediate and intimate existence as parts of the commonplace civilization that we must create and share if the larger institutions are to flourish. Where commonplace civilization thrives, where community and inclusion and pluralism and trust thrive on the ground, it becomes possible for the larger institutions to flourish. Where they are absent, and there is no more profound and robust correlation in all of the social sciences than this, where they are absent, no matter how inspired or equitable the Constitution, liberal democratic institutions will fail. I think often of an exhibition that I saw in New York not so many years ago. It was devoted to the city of Jerusalem in the year 1000. And what it showed, remarkably and movingly, was that the three peoples who shared the city at that time as they do now, Christians and Muslims and Jews, on the whole, managed to get along, to coexist rather ably. They coexisted in spice markets. They made objects for each other. They illuminated each other's books. Oh, there was suspicion and bad feeling, mistrust and enclosure. Nonetheless, they coexisted sufficiently so that there are objects and artifacts which art historians still are not sure if they're Christian objects made for a Jewish market or Muslim objects made for a European market. A beautiful blurring of boundaries was essential to the practice of social coexistence. Of course, at the end of that century, the Crusades came, and with them, massacre and counter-massacre and counter-counter-massacre. And that fragile and yet deeply human coexistence was ruined. All that liberal institutions attempt to do, all that the practice of liberal democracy attempts to do, all that La Fontaine and Baldwin stood for when they stood together against the mob, is the idea that we must make that human practice of coexistence into a permanent principle of pluralism. That's all it is. That's what it involves. Because the human practice of coexistence is so planetary, so widespread in so many cultures, it can always be reborn. But because it's so difficult to turn that practice into a permanent principle of pluralism, it always risks being destroyed again. What do we do? How do we go forward? First, to protect the larger liberal democratic institutions with our lives. To refuse the normalization of things that can never be made normal or accepted as normal. Not to engage in the kind of passive resignation which has infected far too many of my American countrymen. The constant rationalization, the sense that if it hasn't hit me yet or my group, it's tolerable, it's not too bad. We need to take to the streets and to the ballot boxes with our heels and our lives to defend those larger institutions. But at the same time, we have to recognize that those institutions will be worthless if they are not constantly reinforced by building community near at hand, by making 
and reinforcing commonplace civilization. We can feel in my adopted city of New York every week and every day how drained the social trust, the social capital of the city becomes as that commonplace civilization is destroyed by social inequality, as it's destroyed by the existence of those oligarchs' erections, as it's destroyed by the pervasive feeling that we are not all in this together, but that we are divided as a people, destroyed by the reduction and the eradication of the public sphere, of the common good, of libraries and universities, the privatization, even though the one lesson we can take from history and social science alike is exactly that it's investing in and building a rich public sphere that's the necessary precondition for the private sphere to flourish and persist. Democracy begins in education, in sympathy. Adam Smith himself believed not that markets would make men and women free, but that free men and women might choose markets. That double action is essential if we are to survive this dangerous and perilous time. It's difficult. And yet, in another way, it's amazingly simple. One of my favorite stories ever told is of that great and astonishing Sufi mystic, Nasruddin, great clown prince of the Muslim imagination. I'm sure you've all heard the stories of that remarkable mullah. My favorite of those great and rich comic anecdotes is one where mullah Nasruddin is on one side, one bank of a river, and he sees someone, a stranger, on the opposite bank. And the stranger calls out to him, how do I get to the other side? And Nasruddin says, you are on the other side. <laughs> I think that's one of the most politically potent <laughs> tales and fables ever told. Because what it reminds us is that we all begin on the other side. That the ground immediately beneath our feet is the place where our work must start. And that it's in the acts of sympathetic imagination that enable us to understand that the other, the man, the woman, the outsider, the stranger, on the other side of the river is actually exactly in the same position we are, just as other and just as rooted. If we can make that vision of pluralism, a pluralism rooted in acts of sympathetic engagement with everyone we see on the other side of the river, then liberal humanism might survive and the rhino might live. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. In the musical theater, where I spend a great deal of my time these days, oddly enough, this is called the talkback section. <laughs> So, John, <laughs> well, you made I, notes? <laughs> I was trying to make notes, but of course I can't read them Thank at you. this point. You know, of course. I thought that was fabulous. And I think, uh, and I, I, can I start with something pessimistic, which Please. is, um, uh, I mean, psychologically or humanly, why do you think that people are so passive, passive resignation? It's not just in New York. I mean, no. it's all over the place. Right. These things are being broken away. And people, you know, there are all these youth movements, which is fabulous, but then there are, there's everybody else. So is it just what always happens, or? Two things I think are true. One is, and um, the first is that the new model of authoritarianism, authoritarianism always mutates to, to fit its time. It's not one that I'm speaking here of Trumpism, very directly. It's not one where you burn down the, the Reichstag in six weeks and shut down the newspapers. It's one in which you exactly erode, and this has been true in Turkey and in Hungary, where bit by bit you erode 
people's faith in the system. And because <clears throat> none of us is immediately uh, at risk, or many of us are not immediately at risk, we don't identify with the people who are at risk. We identify with our own past and our own roles. So it becomes much harder to have the urgency of resistance <coughs> going on every day. That's, I think, a big part of it. Another part that disturbs me, or doesn't disturb me, concerns me, is, you know, you mentioned we have this amazing uh, efflorescence in the last couple of days of the, uh, you know, kind of children's crusade, the movement against, uh, to make us aware of climate change and global warming. It's an, it's an astonishing thing. But that kind of mass action only becomes real when it uh, penetrates political institutions. Uh, I passionately believe in passion, but I even more passionately believe in politics. And by politics, I don't mean hmm. parliamentary compromise. I mean La Fontaine and Baldwin. I mean uh, finding a, a, a home rule, finding ways of actually making those things happen. And unless you have the political institutions that are ultimately responsive, then you have uh, disaster. One of the problems in the United States, of course, is that our political institutions are hideously retrograde and have a huge anti-democratic deficit, or I guess I should say a democratic deficit attached to them. Um, that's why we all look north <laughs> for inspiration. Yeah, but, but as you know, there are, I mean, flaws, you know, the, the static nature of French society, the, the, the British believing they're somewhere that they're not at all. Yes. You know, sort of delusional state. Oh, well, if we're talking about Even the delusional the states wrong, of the Brits you know? and the French, we'll be here all night. <laughs> <laughs> but, I, you know, I do think, too, that we have to, to recognize that uh, anxiety about identity is real. This is something I try to write about a lot in the book. It's something that those of us who are proudly liberal, cosmopolitan humanists uh, are suspicious of. But our suspicion comes at a cost of uh, honesty. People, everyone in the world, groups, national groups, ethnic groups, are frightened by what they see as a threat to their identity. And you have constant waves throughout history, American history, Canadian history. Mm -hmm. Canadian history is marked by it in its own way as much as, as, as any other kind. Yeah. And mirroring often the United yes. States or the other way around, right. whatever. Tra or tragically often. And that's something that we, uh, and as a consequence, you know, I sometimes think, and I know this is very much an, an outlier position, I sometimes think that Donald Trump is kind of the bullet in the game of Russian roulette that the United States has been playing with itself since the Civil War, meaning that that kind of ignorant ethnic nationalism, that kind of the politics of fear and paranoia, have always been present in the United States. In every economic uh, moment and in every period, uh, Joe McCarthy, Huey Long, mm. George Wallace, people forget now that Archie Bunker, does anyone here remember Archie Bunker is the great <laughs> sitcom star of, uh, he was the character, I should say, Carol O'Connor was an extraordinary liberal man who played him, but Archie Bunker is Donald Trump to the letter in 1971. That's who Donald Trump is, is Archie Bunker in power. So those currents, I think, coexist at every moment, mm. and we delude ourselves, John, I think if we think that we can ever extinguish them. We're going to be perpetually beleaguered. So, but, so that, in a way, that's why, I, you know, there have always been these youth movements. Right. They've taken every, every form from the French Revolution. Everyone right. forgets how young most of those people were as they right. cut off, got people's heads cut right. off and then their own. Um, so, but we've gone through this sort of 40, 50 year period where people said, I don't want to be in dirty politics, I want to do NGOs, I want to influence, right. not have power. Right. So do you, I mean, this is just a sort of guessing for the fun of it. Do you think we're now, are, are these new generations now ready to actually get dirty and take power? My daughter is. Um, <laughs> no, I'm, because it is, as you yes. say, it's about, if you don't take power, it's all very well to influence your enemies if you can, but. I think, power is right. how you pass laws. I, I will say one of the things that I think is bad that uh, intellectuals, philosophers, I, one of the things I love about France is that any journalist with a lot of opinions is called a philosopher. <laughs> right? That's why, why I loved living there for so long. Um, but I think it is true that we downgrade, we degrade politics at enormous peril. Uh, and I have, and it's easy to do because a lot of the people who practice politics are not terribly admirable as human beings, but I still think that that's one of the great moral adventures, and I have uh, enormous uh, 
respect and admiration for anyone who tries it, however quixotically. But you're out there all over the place, and you're in a lot of universities and colleges. Do you have this sense, this is a big leap, because it is, in a sense, ruining your life by going yes. to politics. We know yes. how tough and mean it is, and as mean as it was right. in the 19th century, we're, we're past even, the polite right. period now. Right. You know. Do you think that people are starting to say there's only one way, and it's to go in, or...? I, I think that there's, to be honest, I think a lot of um, uh, people I almost said kids. Kids today, I, I, you know, you try and keep yourself 45. from becoming, you know, an Alta Cocker if you possibly can. But I think it's true that there's a there's a mistrust of the institutions of democracy. And I think, as I tried to say tonight, however ineptly, that some of that mistrust is simply the result of overfamiliarity. We've now grown up for three generations with those institutions of liberal democracy, largely unthreatened and unquestioned. Mm. If you didn't if you weren't a conscious adult during the 1940s, you've seen them threatened, certainly, but they've never been under direct assault in quite that way. And I think as a consequence, we, try, we tend to underestimate, as I said tonight, both their deep roots in human experience and their extraordinary fragility as specific institutions. I mean, I love, you know, I think the title of your last book, you know, Mind Over Matter, kind yes. of captures yes. all of this, that it, 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 it really is at the end, you have to decide what it is that you're willing yes, and to do. John, if I may say, I may not have said it with sufficient clarity tonight. That's not a kind of metaphysical no, notion. No, no. It's a very specific idea. It's what Baldwin and LaFontaine are all about. It's why, you know, we often talk about this. I love going to Iceland. You know, my, my wife is pure Winnipeg Icelandic. And we love to go to Iceland because Iceland is this tiny country that has absolutely no resources, natural resources to speak of, except for the powerful culture of its people the powerful democratic and literate, the social capital that Icelanders have accumulated. I had the most remarkable political experience of my life when I went in 2016 to cover the Icelandic presidential election, where an obscure professor of history at the University of Iceland decided to run, Gundi Johansson, and won. And seeing the way that the entire island was inspired by this example and by the examples of his opponents, it was a close election finally, was a thrilling reminder of the close relationship between democratic institutions and commonplace civilization, community capital, if you like. And remember, this is not something that is in any sense genetic. There was no, it was not very long ago when the Icelanders had the drowning pool where if you lost the election, you, they put you in the water. So <laughs> I think that that's a wonderful reminder of the, of the strength of, of such things, you know, and their fragility as well. So we're going to try to go to maybe four of the speakers just to get them to intervene a bit. And um, the first one is Jafar uh, Abdul Karim, who's uh, a journalist in Germany who's Lebanese origin. And I don't know where uh, Jafar, Jafar is. is. Somebody, there he is. Yeah. I don't know if we can get light on you or you just have to. I got light now. <laughs> <laughs> he, br he brings his light with him, as they say about <laughs> Um, yeah, my name is Jaffa Abdelkari, I'm a journalist working for Deutsche Welle in Germany and I'm very happy to be here and it's my first time in Toronto. I really love the city, the vibe of the city and uh, since yesterday we've been at the Six Degrees so we're discussing a lot of things um, about immigration, inclusion, identity, where do I belong and actually it's very positive because you get a lot of insights but it also makes you think a lot and a lot <laughs> and uh, that's why I have a question for you Mr. Dopnik. I would like to know if it's my personal subjective point of view I've been traveling a lot because of my job I have the feeling when it comes to tolerance respect um, inclusion, respecting minorities, human rights, the standard and the level is changing. From my personal point of view, it's more negative. When I arrived in Germany and Europe, I really loved it because I come from a region where human rights are not at the best, so I really respected how people respect each other, how they um, accept each other. So that's changing. It's getting more like we, what you mentioned before, and they, the people coming. Inclusion 
is leading, leading to exclusion. And as an immigrant, you feel you're suffering with the, with the word belonging and identification with the new country you live in. So you're there, you have laws, you have a structure that's supporting, you have um, a government that's working on, so immigrants feel home, but the feeling of belonging and identification is a feeling. You cannot say you have to feel, you don't feel, it's something very personal. So what should be done that we work more, even here in Canada, when I talk to people, some people who are immigrants, they also have this feeling, which is the belonging. I have the citizenship, but the belonging thing. So what should be, even in Germany, in Europe, so what should be done that the belonging feeling changes? Because when I feel I belong, then I identify, and when I identify, I, I do more for the country. So what's, what's your opinion on that? It's such a huge and rich question. Um, uh, it was one, the first part of it was one of the things I was trying to talk about tonight. It's exactly the degradation of, uh, uh, of pluralism, the degradation of, of inclusion in the language of, our, of, this, uh, of this event and so on. Um, I, I tried to say two things about it. You know, as the grandchild of immigrants who came, of double immigrants who came to America uh, without a word of English and uh, from Eastern Europe, from, uh, from Portugal, I recognize that some part of the immigrant sense of belonging and not belonging is endemic to the experience of immigration. In other words, you're always going to have a double or hybrid identity if you, have, if you are bringing together two experiences. My grandparents embraced the cultures and practices of North America, but they still had a strong sense of rootedness that would never go away. And I think that we diminish the immigrant experience if we expect, uh, you know, a solvent of all alienation. That wouldn't be human. It wouldn't be, it wouldn't be admirable. So I don't, I'm not troubled necessarily by the idea that we'll always feel uh, a little uneasy about uh, belonging and not belonging if we felt the people who feel too facilely or too complacently that they belong are the worst people on earth. Um, so I don't envy their sense of belonging. That's not something that I, I envy more of those people who feel that they exist with multiple identities and hybrid identities and complex identities. On the second side of it, though, on the question of welcoming or rejecting the other, I think that that's a foundational uh, liberal humanist principle. That's why I told the story of Nasruddin at the end. We are all on the other side, even as we're on this side. It's, there's one side of the river in, in that allegorical sense. And I think we all have to work hard. That's why I thought that whatever, and you can tell me far more than I can tell you about this, whatever political price Angela Merkel paid for the welcoming Syrian refugees, it was, I thought, terribly telling that Vladimir Putin would pull that out as the thing he had most contempt for, somebody trying to institutionalize a practice of compassion, of not treating uh, the alien as the other. Uh, that's something that we can be, however embattled it is as an emotion and a practice, something I think we can be very proud of. And in Canada as well. I mean, it, it's almost as if this, you know, very basic idea of empathy is still questioned. And interesting enough, it's questioned sometimes on the left and yes. on the right. Yes. And then the rise of questioning empathy uh, today, it's, it's, I guess it's part of these cycles that you've been talking about. It, it, it's, it's a little confusing, it's a little frightening. That... It's, it's terrible. I mean, look, if there's one thing, and I talk about this in the book, uh, and I'm, perhaps I should have said something about it tonight, I did elliptically. Um, if there's one place where the ideas that inspired Baldwin and LaFontaine begins, it's with 18th century when people start talking about the spark of, hum of social sympathy as the thing that brings human societies together. Not hierarchy and divinity, but the shared spark of social sympathy. As you know, far better than I, John Hume and Smith all talk about this. It's a crucial mucilage and cement of human societies. And when that comes under, is treated with disdain or contempt by anyone of any ideology, then the foundational premises. That's what LaFontaine and Baldwin were all about. They were saying, we are very different people who represent 
very different societies who have who faiths that have been at war with each other for hundreds of years, and yet what we have in common, the empathy, the sympathy we can feel for each other's place is enough to build a country on. I think that's an astonishing and still inspiring belief. Absolutely. So let's, uh, 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 Carol uh, Lutfi, who's the head of Apathy is Boring, uh, based here. I, mm -hmm. Where is Carol? Over here. Yeah. Sorry there are no spotlights. No, that's <laughs> fine. The um, question so will be the light. I'm, I'm sorry, I'm not, I'm not checking. Where are you? I'm over here, sorry. There, I think. Oh, yes, okay, sorry. <laughs> uh, so I run a nonprofit called Apathy is Boring, and we work on engaging youth in our democracy. Just a small task. Um, you spoke about bringing the coffeehouse conversations back and the work that's mm -hmm. required to do that in terms of building social trust, which then leads into uh, translating into political institutions, hopefully. So my question to you is, you know, we've, we've heard about ideas around new power and old power and building power from the bottom up versus top down. I'm only really seeing meaningful engagement on this issue from the nonprofit sector or the academic community. Both sectors that are under-resourced, and I don't think this should be on the backs of only those two players in our society. What will it take to get all sectors to make this a priority and what needs to happen for these coffeehouse conversations to actually be something that happens once again? It's a terrific question. I thought you were going to ask me an even harder question, though, <laughs> <laughs> which is, what's the role, of, excuse me, the digital technology and the internet plays in all of this? Because one of the great, I think, disappointments and disillusionments of the past 20 years is that digital technology and globalization of the internet, which we imagined would be, make the whole world one big coffee house, has not played that role. Instead, it's made the whole world one big battlefield. Um, that's a very, and that's been a very disappointing, I think, and, and in some ways disillusioning reality. Um, at the simplest level, we need good government. We need, as I said before, there's no stronger correlation in all of history or social science than the reality that if we invest in public institutions, which can create those kinds of conversations, if I may be allowed to say the CBC, who I gather are taping this tonight, is a prime example of that kind of an institution that enables uh, an entire uh, continent to speak on one frequency or, with, or at least and with a multiplicity of voices. When I did the Massey Lectures back in 2011, the thing that I couldn't get over, I went from St. John to, uh, to Vancouver, and the thing that I couldn't get over is in this physically vast country, there was an enormous continuity of values, an enormous continuity. I mean, there was, the values were evidenced by the fact that people were willing to come out to listen to a lecturer on the radio. That's not something that would happen uh, in the same ease in the United States, would not happen at all in the United States, would happen in France if they could not understand what the lecturer was saying and could debate it afterwards. But those are the kinds of institutions, those are the kinds of institutions that are essential. In other words, it shouldn't be uh, bless every NGO that does that, but I think that we need that those kinds of investment in the public sector, which is one of the things that most distinguishes Canada's cultural history, uh, from the CBC to the NFB and uh, Canada Council, our great museums, the, uh, the reality that our universities are publicly subvented rather than dependent simply on the will of oligarchical yeah. less and I'm well less aware, and John, less, unfortunately. Less and, unfortunately, <laughs> unfortunately, less and less, and therefore necessarily more and more. That yeah, would be what, yeah, I'd, what I'd yeah, say. Yeah. I mean, this is, you know, Harold Innes wrote about this right. and got it out of the indigenous yes. ideas of almost spatial communication. Yes. And, uh, and maybe because the country is so large, people have had to make this, this really conscious effort to understand what's going on in the other parts of we'll it. Sp we'll spin apart if, if we don't. If, yeah. if we don't, don't make the effort. If we don't make the effort. I think, yeah. that that's, I think that's true. So uh, you, uh, one of the points I wanted to make tonight, and I excise just because it, I didn't want to keep you here for hours and hours, is the crucial role, you know, I was talking about uh, commonplace civilization, social I, capital. I love building. the use of the commonplace <laughs> and then the, right, the, and the noun, the, I love that. Exactly. That was Olmsted's, not mine. Yeah, I tried to sneak that in as mine, but <laughs> I'm caught out. Is that the crucial role of the arts, now I know that sounds like one of those things that the vice principal says in eighth grade, we believe in a crucial role for the arts in education, but it's really true, it's really true, that there's not, that all of that, there's a wonderful paper someone wrote, a, a sociologist paper, about what he called the commune. Do you know this work, John? 
where he talks about what is it that made cities like Florence in the 15th century right. or Amsterdam in the 17th century such incredibly flourishing places for painting. And he identifies specific traits of what he calls the communal traits, the communes, that these places had in common. They involve competitive relationships amongst artists who lived in close adjacency and many other things. But that's, those are the fruits of the roots. Those are the things we, we look for and they in turn uh, feed our, that our, our art feeds our values more potently, I think, than any other. And, and you know, it, it's actually fascinating. When we started this program, Cultural Access Pass, now Canoe, right. and we started with six institutions in Toronto? And three institutions right. in Toronto. Very hard to get them to work together in the beginning. Mm -hmm. Now we're at 1,500. Amazing. It's easy now, because right. everyone gets it, and they say, why aren't we in? But <clears throat> the fascinating thing is, you, you know, some people would say, well, why would they, these people don't have time? You know, that kind of, they should be working hard. I mean, as if they weren't working right. really, really hard. And we're now in, uh, how many people have gone through the program now? 300,000, about 300,000 people have gone through the program. Now we've got on an app, whatever that is, and the result <laughs> is that the number of people every year is already doubled That's that fantastic. we're getting on it. So there's a real hunt, and you know, the, then the, the first one of the performing arts groups to come in was the Canadian Opera Company, and then the symphonies are in all across the country, they give free seats. And people start saying, well, you know, immigrants going to the opera, well, we put it all in our line um, system. The seats are gone in 30 seconds. Yes. I mean, yep. everybody who comes understands that culture is at the heart of, of what happens. Let's, let's go to Max Finday, who is uh, from the Sweetgrass First Nation in Saskatchewan. And he runs, he's an amazing guy. I uh, met him last night. You met him last night. And he runs something called Canadian Roots Exchange, which brings together young indigenous and non-indigenous Canadians to deal to talk about uh, re how to do reconciliation. Max, where are you? John, you're worse than my mother. That's <laughs> enough, Max. That's enough. Okay. Um, I take that as a compliment, Max. Thank you. Nanaskuman, nitutim, mio kisagawa notes, mio papikskwe, mina, those were um, great words, Adam. I appreciate you coming here and doing that, and I want to um, you know, take us, uh, take us a little further back. You talk about the Massey lectures. It was just some uh, months ago that, uh, that our auntie uh, uh, Tanya Talago was delivering the Massey lectures, uh, the last Massey lecture series on this stage. And, you know, as I, as I sat tonight and heard you talk about these values of liberalism, you know, equality and tolerance, um, you know, uh, egalitarianism, all these sorts of things, um, I was taken back to her words. I was taken, taken back to her message, maybe uh, the message that some of, um, some of you in the audience have heard. I was also taken um, back to your, uh, your head clearing, uh, this, this moment that you went and, and played piano on, on Bloor Street and, and uh, said it was so quintessentially Canadian that in New York they would have built, uh, they would have built a high-rise. I thought that was quite funny. No, they would have um, actually made the piano into a condo. That's Three right. apartments, right, yes, in yes, that yes, space. Yes, yes. Absolutely. You know, I think for um, many indigenous people, many native peoples in this, in this country, um, if we were to go and, and play that piano, well, we'd only be able to play two of the 88 keys. You know, we might have started off with 88, but then been reduced to, to just the two, and the two might have been the ones that stick. <laughs> So I wonder, you know, Adam, as you're, as you're delivering this lecture, as you're, talking, um, as you're talking about, you know, the way that you see things changing in Europe, you, you point to, uh, you point to um, our neighbors down south and talk about, you know, the difficulty and, and uh, um, you know, the changes that are happening there, but you didn't really touch on Canada all that much. So I wonder, um, I wonder about liberalism in whose name? I wonder about equality in whose name I wonder about egalitarianism in whose name I wonder about respect in whose name and, and empathy in whose name I wonder um, Adam if you can talk a little bit about how you reconcile that sure that's a wonderful question maybe it's a good place to to end um, let me address in a couple of ways I didn't want to talk as much about Canada outside of it because I feel it's awkward I you all know far more about Canada than, than I can pretend to. And I didn't want to seem like a presumptuous outsider rather than a, a long lost uh, native son. Uh, you've touched exactly on the most 
sensitive and difficult part of the liberal tradition and the liberal inheritance. It's something I write about at great length in the book, and that is the history of colonialism, the history of the oppression and persecution of indigenous peoples, not just in Canada, but obviously in the United States and Australia and around the world. That's a very, and the history of colonialism in Africa as well. It's one of the great dark marks on the history of the moral enterprise of liberalism. And no one, whether in Canada or in uh, Britain or anywhere else, can try to expunge or ignore or eradicate that history. What I'd say is, is that it's one of the crucial conceptions of liberal humanist tradition to engage in a constant moral accountancy about one's own acts and the acts of the past that one has inherited, to try and look at them as honestly as one can, to try to no longer obscure them, and to try to, as best one can, remedy and recompense, recompense the, the wrongs of the past. What I'd say on behalf of the tradition that I unashamedly evangelize for is that on the whole, that tradition has been better at doing that moral accountancy of trying to address the questions that you rightly raise of for whom and on whose behalf than most other traditions. The history of humankind, tragically, is a history of oppression, persecution, enslavement, and horror. And then it begins to become a history where we recognize that those things are deeply wrong. And at any one moment in our history, we have to extend and expand those circles of compassion. When I talked about Mill and Taylor by the rhinoceros cage, I think it's easy for us to forget that when Harriet Taylor was writing on the subjection of women, women had no civil rights. Women essentially had no civil rights in, throughout the Western world. And one of the great moral adventures has been uh, women's conquest of their world of rights. And clearly one of the great moral adventures, one of the great moral necessities of the Canadian present is to recognize the Canadian past. That's true in every country at every time. If we fail in that enterprise, we will have failed the foundational premises of liberal democracy. That's not enough. That will never be adequate uh, to those who feel the deep persecution of the past. But it is, I think, one of the responsibilities that those of us who believe in liberal democracy have to shoulder and have to persist in. Can we um, if, if do one more? All right. It, it, um, and that's uh, Aude Favre, who works in France revealing false news or fake news, and uh, Pambo, who's from Mexico and does wonderful things uh, in theater, and uh, where, are, where are you? You're there, so they're gonna stand up together, I believe, and do yes. something, I don't know. <laughs> there you are, have you got a mic? Yeah, I am the French. Okay. Et vous pouvez le faire en français, si vous voulez. Oui, en français, s'il vous plaît. Tu peux poser la question en français? Oui, si vous voulez. Um, alors, uh, bah déjà, première, mais tout le monde comprend là quand je parle en français? The pupil. Si les gens rient. Because I've been uh, speaking, uh, you know, I was speaking English all the time, so. Uh, Go whatever. In English, then. Yeah. I'll translate. No, 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 I'll translate français. into French. No, no. Uh, je, je suis très impressionnée déjà première chose par cet événement uh, uh, Six Degrees. Uh, je peut-être qu'il existe l'équivalent en, en France, mais à ce moment-là, j'aimerais bien le connaître parce que je j'ai jamais entendu. Euh, parler d'un, en tout cas, d'un événement qui ressemblera à celui-là et qui euh, euh, qui permettrait comme ça de faire émerger des idées euh, aussi brillantes que celles que j'ai entendues euh, euh, aujourd'hui. On a parlé de, de comment lutter contre le, le, le la, la désinformation en ligne, euh, comment lutter contre le. Euh, maintenant, j'ai les mots anglais qui me viennent. Hate speech. <rire> Il n'y a pas okay. une équivalente en français. Et pardon. Il n'y a pas une équivalente. Euh, bah, euh, bah, si, si, euh, le, comme on dit, le, le, la, la haine, hein, le discours de haine en ligne. Non, ok, c'est une mixture, you know, in my, now in my head. Euh, et euh, euh, moi, je voudrais juste euh, vous poser une, une question très simple qui est... Euh, euh, je, je voudrais savoir... Vous, le problème, je trouve, moi, pour moi, j'essaie de savoir euh, quelle, quelle initiative... Euh, 
encourager, qui serait la plus, quelque part la plus efficace euh, pour lutter contre euh, ce, ce défi-là démocratique. Euh, et, et en fait, je n'en trouve pas précisément. Je voulais savoir, vous qui connaissez très bien le sujet, est-ce que euh, voilà, vous avez en tête peut-être des exemples canadiens ou des, des initiatives qui vous semblent très, très puissantes justement pour, euh, pour lutter contre, ces, ces, voilà, contre ce, ce problème majeur qui touche aussi la France, <rire> vraiment euh, de manière assez forte, même si... Voilà. Et je pense que tout le monde a compris, parce que je ne peux pas traduire. Pambo, où est-ce que tu vas Well, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm an artist from Mexico City. As you know, we have this uh, new government going in. And, uh, well, it's, it's quite new. Uh, the, 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 active is, the active citizenship, because uh, now everybody is aware of politics in the last year. So, um, I, I, I'm really uh, surprised about how diversity acts in here and how do they uh, make citizenship part of their lives. So I, I, I wanted to ask, uh, I don't know how to say it in English, uh, like, what do you think is the 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 way that we as a new uh, a, a kind of society, uh, which, which would be the, the, the better way to act? Uh, it's really the first democratic well, government. Yeah. Yes, yes, exactly. Well, let me, let me address each, each question in, in turn, obviously. Um, the question of hate speech is one of the most complex and, and difficult ones, I think when we think either abstractly or empirically about uh, liberal societies. Um, one of my great Canadian heroes, or heroines, who I unfortunately isn't here tonight, is uh, Justice Rosie Abella. Uh, an extraordinary woman, began life as a displaced person. And she as, sent a big, big hug. I did she? Oh, oh, did I spoke she? to her. Oh, yes, oh, yes, oh yes, I'm, yes, glad, yes. I'm glad to hear yeah, it. We all yeah. need to be hugged by a justice <laughs> from time to time. Um, <laughs> And what fascinates me is she has written a great deal, and a great deal of jurisprudence, serious ju jurisprudence, just about the question of what is hate speech and why we should banish it. Now, for a million liberal, and particularly one who lives in the United States, the idea of banning speech is extremely uh, scary and something we naturally have an allergy to because one of our pre pre premises is that all speech should be free and hate speech will be recognized for its hatefulness and rejected for that reason. There's a very powerful uh, tradition in Canada and the Canadian jurisprudence which says no hate speech is inherently hurtful and destructive of those values and most important we can identify it. We don't have to say well it's hate speech to you but it ain't hate speech to me. We know what hate speech is when we see it uh, and, and hear it. I tend, and I don't know where John stands in this, I tend to believe that we should always err on the side of excessive tolerance, that there's a greater danger to freedom comes from premature censorship than comes from excessive tolerance. But I recognize that this is a, one of those questions in which we really should talk about modalities rather than models, that every society needs to make those kinds of decisions for itself. In France, it has particularly poignant and weight because of the history of, uh, of Vichy of you know, the 1940s and of the necessity of not allowing that discourse to continue. Canada has a very different uh, set of histories and, and, and so on. I, I don't want to evade your question except to say it's one of the most complicated issues that I know and I try and deal with it in the book and I would urge everyone to read Justice Abella's uh, jurisprudence on this subject for real uh, illumination on it. And, and can I add a yeah. two second thing into that yeah. which is it, former President Penn International we have a charter that was written by John Galsworthy and fixed up by H.G. Wells <laughs> right. in the 1920s, and it's not needed to be changed much. It's about this long. There are two short paragraphs. The first paragraph says 35,000 writers in 125 countries. The first paragraph, we were 850 of them in prison, 200 killed every year. Uh, the first paragraph says we believe in absolutely unlimited freedom of expression. The second paragraph says no writer should encourage hatred among right. people. <laughs> right. 
And, and to a writer, that makes perfect sense, and I think to a citizen, it's really easy. A good editor, I mean, doing away with the editors is introducing the possibility that hatred will get into newspapers. Yes. You see, yes. Anyway. Yes. yes, no, I think, yeah, I, I, actually, I'm sorry, I kind of like you. the idea of doing away with editors, but that's a working, <laughs> uh, working writer's prejudice. <laughs> Let me just add to that, I did, I, in speaking of Penn, I was very involved with the question of Penn in New York, Penn America giving an award to, the, to Charlie Hebdo, to the posthumously to the, to the um, horrible victims of that massacre. And as you remember, that was, a controversial, that was a controversial question. But that was an example, for, in, for instance, where it seemed to me that the necessity of affirming the right to satire, however outrageous, was much more urgent than the, than the uh, necessity of recognizing the possibility of insult. Uh, and I wrote a lot about that at the time. I, that's, but these are among the hardest questions we have to, we have to deal with, and they, I don't think they can be dealt with uh, according to one uh, simple rule. Let me just add at the end, and I know we, we have to go, I had the great pleasure of visiting Mexico for the first time just this, this past year to speak at a, at, a, at a conference. And what struck me is that in Mexico, the, the oscillation of hope and fear that's uh, pervasive in the world right now had a particular intensity. On the one hand, the writers I spoke to were all acutely aware of the social crisis of narco terrorism, of, of the expropriation of the avocado crop, of all of those ways in which democratic institutions were being subverted, and at the same time thought for the first time a genuinely uh, progressive, a genuinely enlightened government was coming to power. I think all of us who care about, when I said we all need to defend democratic institutions with our life, I meant that we ought to have a global perspective as well. When the university is closed down in Hungary, that affects us all. When uh, uh, writers and ordinary people are terrorized in Mexico, that affects us all because all of those things weaken the larger fabric of democracy. We have no choice right now but to be global citizens because the future of the planet is, is entirely at stake. So in a few minutes, Adam is going to go downstairs, courageous man, and sign his wonderful new book, uh, Mind Over Matter. And then, but before we do that, uh, Adrian is going to say a few words, and I just want to say thank you for oh, thank a you fabulous, for fabulous stuff of the Thank you, Tom. <laughs> it's really fantastic. That was a wonderful evening for the Lapon Dane Baldwin lecture. And it's only the end of the first day of Six Degrees. Tomorrow we have other things happening, and I encourage you to come to the Art Gallery of Ontario, to the Family Resources Centre. We are going to have one session that will be how to make allies. It's very useful in a time when enemies are on all sides in different ways, as we pointed out. We'll also be having a wonderful session at 11.30 in Jackman Theatre at the AGO, um, in which uh, Martin Cates will, will talk with Rick Esther Beanstalk uh, and Romeo Dallaire, who will be getting the prize tomorrow evening. Um, it's going to be a very interesting evening with a uh, uh, morning with clips of films, shake hands with the devil, and the topic is basically, could, can the media uh, ever help to forestall humanitarian crisis? Is there a role for media in doing that? Is television, film effective enough to do that? And so I encourage you all to come. We would welcome you uh, tomorrow, and we hope again to see you tomorrow night when I give the prize to Romeo Dallaire. You know, this year has marked, uh, this is our fourth Six Degrees, and uh, it's the 12th year of the Institute of Canadian Citizenship. We've grown. We've developed, and I hope we are improving in every possible way. And this year, we welcomed a new CEO, uh, a terrific person called Yasser Nakvi, who uh, is, in a way, the epitome of what the Institute for Canadian Citizenship stands for, who has spent uh, 10 years of public life as an elected official. He was Attorney General of Ontario. He was Minister of Correctional Services and Government House Leader and we're very happy that he is now our CEO. I want Yasser to come forward for a bit. Thank you.
Thank you, Andrea, for that very, very kind introduction. And I think his story, which he will tell, is one which will resonate with many of us. It certainly resonated with me when I first heard it, because Yasser was born in Pakistan. And um, as a journalist, I went to Pakistan under the dictatorship of Zia al Haq, so I was quite familiar with what that was like. And uh, that was the period when his family left. And I wanted him to tell you how they left and how they came here. Well, it was under General Zia that my father spent nine months as a political prisoner, so um, that brings memories back. Um, Adrian, my, my story is no different than most of immigrants who come to Canada. Um, we came because we wanted to live in a free and democratic society. Um, we were welcomed by strangers as neighbors, attended public schools to get quality public education, and our act of, yes, yes, and we need more public education than last. And our act of active citizenship was to join a political party because we were finally in a country where it was not an offense to be part of a political party. I still have a copy of my father's charge sheet where he's accused and then convicted and spent nine months as a political prisoner for leading a pro-democracy march to urge people to have a right to vote. So by joining a political party allowed me to get into politics and the rest is history. You win some elections, you lose some elections. <laughs> but the point is that I'm very proud of my time as a Canadian citizen to help build my province and my country. And I'm so thrilled to be part of the Institute for Canadian Citizenship team with the leadership of Adrian Clarkson and John Roston Saul with an amazing team at the office that helps put events like this we are, where we are promoting the case, the argument for inclusion, not just in Canada, but around the world. And we need your support for that. Thank you very much. And we, we say in Canada and around the world because we will be in Mexico with six degrees uh, in November. We will be in Berlin again for our second one, uh, our partnership with the Barenboim Saeed Center, uh, the wonderful Frank Gehry Theater there uh, in February. And we will be back in Calgary and uh, in April and we will be in Montreal in March. And tomorrow, uh, I hope that you, if, if you do come, you'll learn a lot more about what we are doing. And I'm very happy that now we have the Nye Children's Choir, who appeared, you may remember, three years ago when they had just started out. And so they are Sir Syrian refugee children, and they've been enlarged by some Lebanese children, and we are very, very happy that they are going to close out our evening. Thank you so much.